Good morning and welcome to today's session where we will be exploring the risks deep fake technology can pose to democratic systems. Goedemorgen en welkom bij de sessie van vandaag waar we de risico's zullen verkennen die deep fake technologie kan vormen voor democratische systemen. Um, that was not me. I speak a little Netherlands, but I don't speak Mandarin, and I certainly don't speak Arabic. So that was an entire fake and fabricated introduction. Oh. We'll come to some of, the, some of the things that we can do with that for good and ill later on today. But can I welcome you to your parliament, your Scottish parliament, for today's session on AI and deepfake politics. I think I'm probably one of the only people who's been really, really excited at being deepfaked. So, so yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's made my week, made my week. Um, but you are welcome today. This is the last day of our 20th uh, series of Festival of, of Politics Years. I hope you've had a good week, a, a combination of discussion, uh, information and maybe the odd debates and, and, and arguments. So we're really, really pleased to be, to be here today to talk about the, the challenges and opportunities presented to our democracies, to, to our society by deep fakes. And this session is run in conjunction with Scotland's Futures Forum, the Scottish Parliament's think tank of which I am a, a board member. We are recording the session for uh, our YouTube channels, uh, and it'll be on our YouTube channels in, in the coming weeks. But please, if you do want to engage on our social media as we go through today, our, our Twitter X handle is visit, at visit Scott Powell, and Instagram is Scott at Scott Powell. So, so please do, do keep a lookout and engage with those if, if that is your thing. I'm very pleased to be joined here today by our panel. We have Jason Box, Robert Moran, and Hannah Perry. Jason is a partner at RXN Group in Washington, DC. He's worked in public affairs and opinion research for more than 20 years, with expertise in communications and digital research, reputation and brand management, campaign and message development, and political strategy. Bob. Bob Moran is a partner at the Brunswick Group, a critical issues advisory firm. He's man a management consultant, communications strategist, futurist, and writer. His new novel, about to be published, Lincoln 2.0, explores the near future of an AI candidate. And I, I know Bob will, will talk a little bit more about that uh, later on this morning. And Hannah is a lead researcher in the tech policy team at Demos, the cross-party think tank on putting people at the heart of policymaking. She's interested in how democratic systems work, how institutions and cultures evolve in a digital age, and is passionate about enabling inclusive and safe environments. So please join me in welcoming our panel this morning. So to begin then, we've, we've seen an example of deep fakes. I, I think some of you, especially those of you who know me, might have realised that that wasn't me. I didn't say any of those words, even, even in the, the, the English version. But what, how, how are deep fakes being used in, in, in our society at the moment? And what, how, do they, how do they work? Who, Bob, do you want to kick things off? Sure. Um, so... There are a number of websites you can go to now uh, that will that you can use to fake your voice, to fake your image. Um, they're used for fun, to be silly, but also for crime, uh, to mimic people, and they're used for sort of other nefarious purposes. Um, they're also used for good. So Modi, in his re-election in India, uh, created a fake of himself. Uh, that allowed people to interact with him on WhatsApp in all the languages of India. And so that would allow him to sort of one-on-one -on -one talk with, in a chatbot form, uh, the voters. So that was one positive. Um, but you could use it to do bad things, too, which is probably 70% of what we'll talk about today. 
Hannah, do you want to come in? Um, I might just add that I think for me, deep fakes are defined by when they are materially misleading. So when they are created to mislead us. Um, they are things that have been possible to make for decades. Um, what's different and probably why we're speaking about it today is how much easier they are for anyone to make. Um, previously, you would need 500 images or more to actually bind and create something that might be actually believable that somebody else um, could be behaving in this manner. Whereas now, the combination of a generative AI tool and a chatbot now enables any of us to go and create something that is materially misleading. So that combination of the technology, its cheap use, um, and the fact that we're all made now able to do this, I think is why it's important for us to have this conversation today. Jason, what are some of the, the uses that, that you're aware of of uh, this technology at the moment for, for good or, or ill? So I consider myself a relatively um, well-informed person, uh, but I've done some research on this, and I don't think I'm actually much different than most people in that I don't, I don't, I'm not aware sort of in my day-to-day -day life of, it, there's nothing ubiquitous to me about, about this sort of penetrative AI misleading technology. I don't see, I mean, we, we, we see it sort of as a, as a vocation, we can go out and identify places and you, and you see it in the US. I mean, Donald Trump retweeted uh, an AI video of Kamala Harris, but I don't think it has risen to the level yet of, oh my God, it's everywhere, and I don't, I don't know what's real and what's fake. Um, it does actually. It is interesting, though, and, and I apologize if you've been in my other sessions because you've heard this now multiple times, <clears throat> but you chose to come to my session. So, um, I, I think it just raises the importance of uh, being digitally and uh, informationally literate. So I think that. Uh, we bear some of the responsibility of being better and more informed citizens in our civil society where we are being, uh, where there's a barrage of information. Forget about misinformation or disinformation. There's just like a lot of data out there. Uh, and we just have to be better, more informed consumers. That's where I will we'll put my $5 on. Bob, do you want? So, oh, go ahead. Um, go I, I just... For me, I think responsibility must start with uh, the states and AI companies and platforms that distribute the content. I totally support. I think we all need to take responsibility. I'm not saying they don't have no, responsibilities, 100%, 100%. but we have to take some responsibility. Yeah, no, I totally agree, and especially now that these are um, tools that we can all, all use right. um, in different ways. I, I would just want us to start with thinking about the responsibilities for those that we kind of bestow our faith in as, as guardians of our state and our democracy, and also the the manufacturers of the tools that profit from their use. Um, we need to start there. So, so J Jason mentioned that the uh, use of, of a deep fake video of, of Harris that Trump retweeted. Bob, you talked about Modi. How, how much is this being used in our political um, campaigning efforts in, in our political environments at the moment? Just a think? little bit. It hasn't been used that much yet. My fear is that it will be used significantly. So just back up for just a second. <clears throat> I'm going to give everybody here a brief tour of the near future of what you're going to experience with this technology. So some of it's going to be weird. So just, but don't like be open to what I'm going to say. So the first thing is many, many people are going to have AI chatbot boyfriends and girlfriends. Those, ex those sites already exist. That technology will get better and better and better and could be used for negative purposes in our own democracy at some points. So that, that's going to happen. Um, the second one is, and this is already happening in China, you will contract with a service to build an AI version of a relative before they die so that you can talk to them after they are deceased. That are, those companies exist in China in traditional cultures that venerate the elderly, this will happen. It's going to happen here too, right? All of the U.S. presidential libraries will take this technology and make it the ability for you to interact with presidents using all of their speeches and material. So think about U.K. politicians that were in politics for a very long time. You could accurately recreate how they talk, how they speak, how they think, how they write, because we have their papers. The same is true with presidential libraries. 
the bad guys are going to create a ton of advertising saying fake stuff and then deploy it digitally. And remember, they're not trying to do like Soviet era propaganda of the 1970s, which was obviously fake. Like it's like, you know, up is down, left is right. You know, it's like animal farm type stuff. No, what they want to do is render our democracies inert by, by annihilating the truth so that you don't know what is true or false, right? In the old days, they were trying to tell you something that was obviously not true. You know, we're a worker's paradise. No, you're not a worker's paradise, right? But nowadays, they're trying to render the truth. They're trying to annihilate the truth. And that's what I think they'll do or try to do by creating hundreds, thousands of fake video ads. And the question is, what do we do to stop it? And luckily, we have Hannah here, who, who has thought a lot about it. Hannah, <laughs> do you want to pick up on that? Sure. Can you remind me of the question? <laughs> <laughs> that was fascinating. I went on that journey with you. What, what question are we... I mean, I, I suppose, how, how is... Um, how, how are deep fake technologies being used today? And, and yeah. where do we see them? Where do we see them going? What, what are the challenges for us as a society, as a democracy, you know, to try and ensure that we don't... We, we use some of the, the beneficial mm. um, aspects of them? Because I think, I think pe people are probably... People are probably both terrified, but also, you know, interested in, in what the possibilities are. 100%. So I think for me, firstly, when I think about deep fakes and I think about generative AI technology, the uses that I regard as most dangerous are where they're being used for non-consensual pornographic content. The most uses that we're seeing at the moment um, is these uses being targeted at women and minorities for... Uh, pornographic content online, which is now illegal in the UK. There was, a, there was a new legislation that was brought out this year which has made the use of that illegal. Um, however, there are <clears throat> nearly 100 apps available, freely available, where you can uh, nudify somebody. So this is why when you told me that you've been deep, deep faked when we arrived, I apologised. So I was so horrified because my immediate response to being deep faked is that something has been taken out, out of your consent. Yeah. Because images and video and your persona can be used in a way that is, is out of your control. And I think that for me is the thing that I'm principally very concerned about. Um, but it has been made illegal, so that's positive. Um, I think in the context of elections and our political candidates, um, we've seen, and I think it's really important to actually be cautious about, um, I think it's really enjoyable to think about um, the kind of dystopian and the, and the fiction <clears throat> and the ways it could be used and also the innovations that are possible. Um, but the actual evidence that we've seen of the impact of deep fakes on our elections this year, and I say this who sat on a lot of panels in the run-up to the UK election, being very fearful. Um, I was very concerned about the use of deep fakes for our election. But what we actually saw, saw during our election is minimal direct impact. Mm -hmm. We saw a lot of people, um, like us, telling everybody to be very fearful of the content that you're going to be consuming. And in, and in line with levels of trust in our democracy more broadly, as a result, we saw deterioration. And not, we don't know if it's directly as a result of our fear-mongering. Um, but we did see, and we have seen, a deterioration in trust, not just in politics... Um, and we're seeing that across the board, but also in our communications and in the material that is being shared online. So when at Demos we polled people during the election and we asked them in July, if, over the last month, um, what, like, how, have you seen any deep fakes about politics or in the context of the election? Just 25% of people said that they thought they may have seen one. Mm. But when you compare that to the proportion of people who are concerned about its impact, that went up to about 65, 68%. And I know you've got polling on this no, as well. well but that was, numbers. Yeah, no, it's that the same was numbers. Yeah, So if you look at people who've actually been affected, or think, and when I say affected, I mean have been exposed to, it's, it's much smaller than we're, than we're saying. And I think it's really important that we're cautious about, about <clears throat> suggesting that this is going to ruin our democracy because I think, I think there are weaknesses and I think this has really shone a light on where we need to build resilience into our systems. But returning to uh, politicians lying, um, that's something that has been happening for, since democracy began. Yeah, yeah. But propaganda is something we learn about in schools. We know that the importance of rhetoric is something that Aristotle has spoken, spoken about. Persuasion and the ability to mislead or make somebody believe something that's real that isn't, is a skill and it's something about we, we learn about. And so this is the next 
the next layer of that. But what I think we need to be thinking about is how do we ensure that our politicians are behaving better? How do we get them to agree on how they use generative AI in their campaigning? I think if we get politicians to agree on, on their uses, and we think about the ethics of politics, and we think about their behaviour, which I know Keir Starmer is looking at, um, these are the methods and steps that we can take to improve trust. So I I'd just be cautious about overstating its impact. Politics be politicians behaving better. Oh, hats. <laughs> it, okay. it, it, it can't be done. I mean, we, they've been... Uh, it can't be done. I love... It, we should point out uh, it wasn't a government agency or watchdog group that called out uh, the deep fake of Kamala Harris. It was sort of crowdsourced compliance. It was, it was the, mm -hmm. the people who were consuming it who were like, I, you know, I call BS. Right. Um, I, think it's, I, I think it's natural and important, uh, particularly from the government side, that we try to at least draw guardrails and boundaries, so some sort of acceptable minimums of behavior. But I still strongly believe that civil society is gonna, is gonna, has to play a role in that. I think we naturally are afraid of anything new. And so technology, particularly when we don't understand it, it's just easier to be scared of it. I, I was chuckling when Bob was talking about, because um, some of you viscerally responded to the idea of talking to your dead relatives. Um, I don't know how many of you are movie buffs, but if you ever saw the original Superman movies with Christopher Reeves, did you viscerally respond badly when he had lovely conversations with his centuries de long dead parents in the in the temple of in the was it the right. solace the so cave of solace? Movies, so, yeah. so none of this is new, and, and you know I, I keep in mind like the defender of uh, of technology and business. But um, can, do any of you off the top of your head know the the number of attributed deaths to um, to uh, car accidents in the 18th century? There weren't any. So we, we are afraid of what we don't understand, and then the thing comes in, and then we adjust, and we figure it out. Uh, I, I firmly believe, and maybe I'm a Pollyanna, uh, we will figure this out. And Hannah's going to help us figure it out. But then we have to help figure it out, too. Uh, well, I was going to ask you, you say, you know, we, we all have a responsibility in, in figuring it out. What, what are the elements of that collective in effort, do you think? Well, recognizing and acknowledging your role uh, as, a, and in this particular specific case, as a consumer of information. Um, uh, too many people, and we get, it's a, it was a different panel, but the difference between misinformation and disinformation, it, it's, it's not terribly accurate uh, language and often we get it wrong. But what it all comes down to is our ability to understand, to spot something that is not real or our, often our inability to spot something, to spot something that is not real. Um, we just have to be smarter, better consumers. And so, so that's definitely on us. But doing so with faith that the government is doing its job and doing so with faith that companies and businesses are doing their job as well. I said this yesterday, and I was embarrassed that I, I, I apologized for saying it. Businesses are composed of people uh, who are parents and neighbors. And I, so I don't buy into the idea, oh, business is bad, like big business is bad. They have a role to play. Uh, and as long as we all acknowledge and embrace our roles, I think it's going to be fine. I, I really believe that. You're not going to make me scared of AI technology. <laughs> not yet. Okay. Not yet. I mean, I'm concerned that what happened, that um, one of the things, doesn't, it doesn't affect our democracy exactly, but um, it affects our market, is that you get deep fakes of a politician or a CEO saying that their company or a business or something is going to do something that would be market moving and then people start trading on Wall Street on it. So to give an example, in this country, a deep fake of like the prime minister saying something like they've dis discovered a new livestock virus and then people hitting the commodity market and shorting the commodity market, right? You would do the same thing in America because we have well-known CEOs with lots of video footage so you could clone what the CEO is saying. And the CEO could say, look, we missed our quarterly earnings. They didn't miss the quarterly earnings, but it says that, and then they short the stock, right? That would be my concern. So is there, I mean, you, you, you talk about a politician saying something about a, a, a new, a novel livestock virus, for instance. 
is there something about how we function as politicians and, and how we set up our political um, process? Because we know that you know every Wednesday lunchtime there's uh, prime minister's questions, every Thursday lunchtime there's first minister's questions. You know, we know who sits next to them. We know the, the setup is the same week after yes. week after week after week. Are, are we are we leaving ourselves open to more or, or, or to, to making it easier to people for for people to? Yes. In the American context, we have a number of agencies that report out at very structured times reports on unemployment, on consumption, on warehousing, all that. And the Wall Street knows exactly when those reports get released. So my concern would be that they would try to insert at that point from a business perspective, because that's what, you know, we don't, I don't do democracy, I do business. So it's a little bit different. I think, I think there are a number of steps that, that could be taken to, to help companies demonstrate what of their content is reliable um, and also for consumers to be able to identify. Because I think what's really important, firstly, is um, when these models are being used, um, um, actually the companies have already committed um, to trying to find technological ways of watermarking um, what is produced by their models. So it's much clearer um, when something has come from a specific model it will have they're aiming. It's, it's incredibly difficult um, to do, but they have committed to exploring technological solutions to that. Um, the next thing is also the labelling of the content. So if you're a broadcaster or if you're a platform and you are distributing the content, you also label when it's very clear that it's AI generated. Um, but also as a, as, a, as a company, if you are, if you are um, putting in place codes of practice for how you are distributing content, you also make your consumers aware of how to recognise when your content is produced by that business. And so it's really important that, I mean, we talk about all the different steps that we individually should be making. Every company, every state actor, um, everyone with responsibility in a particular context for distributing content and communications needs to be thinking about their codes of practice um, in a way to help demonstrate and bridge trust with their consumers and their audiences so that it's it's clearer um, when their audiences can trust their content and they know that it's been authenticated by them. If it in terms of live broadcast, I think cybersecurity, other things that will um, build defences to attacks, um, that's beyond my expertise, but that's more defensive strategies. And and are some of those are those conversations happening, do you think? I mean you, you talked about the, the legislative tool that has been used to prevent or, or, or to at least criminalise the, the pornographic um, manipulations. Are, are there, are there, are there things, are those conversations happening? Is our legal and regulatory uh, s system up for this, do you think? <laughs> not in the US. Okay. Um, so I, I, I have not yet plugged my company. I'm going to do it now. <laughs> so we just released a, a, a practice within our company that does state level AI regulatory consulting. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is because uh, all of the AI regulation right now is happening at the state level because it's not happening at the federal level. Uh, so um, I don't believe, well, certainly in the U.S. it's not really happening. The conversations are happening, but nothing is actually being done. And the states, uh, you know, all politics is local. The states are taking things into their own hands. So it is getting done, but not at this broad federal level. Um, it, ha it, it will eventually happen, but it's not happening right now. What, what do we need to help catalyze that action, then, do you think? Well, it's always about money, right? It's resources. Mm -hmm. uh, right. You, there's a reason why government lags behind the technology sector in terms of being able to regulate it. It's because the smartest people in technology, they don't go work for government. They go work for technology companies. Uh, same thing happens in financial services. The smartest people in finance don't go work for, for, the, for the SEC. They go work for Wall Street. Uh, so, so government needs the tools and the money uh, to be able to hire these, these smart people who can at least try to keep up with the technology and the innovation because they can't currently. Bob, you, you were talking earlier about you know, laying out examples of, of just how, um, how convincing some of these, these technologies will be, or if, if indeed they not there already. In your novel, in, in Lincoln 2.0, you, you create this um, real-world example of running a fake president. Do you, want, do you want to just talk through the thinking behind that and where that takes us in terms of what we need to be concerned about, worried about in, in our democratic structures? So um, back in 2015 or 2016, after 
this festival. I wrote an article in Huffington Post called Lincoln 2.0, which you can Google. It'll come right up. And then I said, I need to write a novel on it. Well, it took me 10 years, eight years to do it, but I finally got it done. It's how can I say this? The novel is a thought experiment masquerading as a tragedy, but it's really a thought experiment. And the thought experiment is what if a bunch of guys like me and Jason get money from a tech billionaire to run an AI for president? What happens? And here's what, here's what happens. In the novel, I was like, okay, how would they do this? They have a couple different issues. The first is they, they have to make it think. So they run two teams. They have a, essentially a team running the technology we have today, and then they have a moonshot team, which would be strong AI. The strong AI team wins out, and they make history. But So I write it in the near future where you have a strong AI. Strong AI is like thinking AI as opposed to large language models, which are really like a parlor trick. right? You guys know this. A large language model just guesses the next word. right? Okay. And then they use deep fake technology to create the image of Abraham Lincoln talking, and they just use what we called in the United States daguerreotypes, early photography. Daguerre, the inventor of photography from France, the daguerreotypes. That's what Americans had in the 1860s for photography. We have those of Lincoln, so you import those in, and you make something that looks very much like a very tired Abraham Lincoln. Um, and then you can write really convincing speeches because we have so many of his speeches and his letters and everything else, right? And so that's what, that's what they do. They get started. The bad guys don't like it. The bad guys have two strategies. The first strategy is to create many, many other Lincoln 2.0s to confuse people as to who the real candidate is. And the second strategy is to hack into and reassassinate Lincoln 2.0. Which they do, I'm, I'm ruining the novel, which they do, but he was backed up offshore in Basingstoke, England, and in uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, so it doesn't really matter, because the, you know, the tech billionaire was smart enough to just back him up in two data centers in the U.S., or in the U.K., and the, in the UAE, so like, reload, you know. So, but, but that's what, that was sort of the, the, the thought experiment, right? Um, but there is, but here's the funny thing. There was a member of parliament trying to run as like an AI version of himself in this last election or announced he was going to do it. The US as well. There's the yeah, there's a, a guy running for the mayor of Cheyenne, Wyoming, who wants to have Vic be the candidate. And so when, so in our system, right, you can't run an AI. You have to run a human. So what you do is you say I'm I'm like the human, but I will defer to the AI. And so that's what this guy's trying to do in Wyoming, in our state of Wyoming right now. Better enjoy your job while you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are lots of, lots of people that lots of, uh, w would wish to get rid of lots of politicians in, in that way. But, but, but I mean, th th there's something about the, the uh, reincarnation is maybe not the right word, but you know, uh, having, having that regenerative uh, capacity for, for politicians, for, for other people, I mean, that, that, that really, really does bring very big questions in around trust, around the morality and, and, and the ethics of this. How do, we, how do we even begin to have those kinds of conversations in a meaningful way that, that aren't sensationalist, aren't utterly dystopian, but actually help us to understand what, what it is we need to be doing? Hannah, do you want to have a start? Yeah, I mean... I think when you introduced me, you described um, the way that we work at, at Demos. We really believe in involving the public in deliberative processes to develop the policy that we recommend. And we really endorse that approach also in, in the design and the consultation of the development of technologies. We think that technologies should be developed um, as a reflection of the values of our society um, before they're released and, and throughout their release before they go onto the market thinking about um, how to be thoroughly tested for specific and different use cases. Because I think what's really challenging with new technologies, that firstly, they're not, tech, they're not neutral. They're not value neutral. You know, they re they're reflective of the data sets that, that are inputted into them. These are historical. They reflect old values. Um, and 
just recognising that in their development is really important. But also that they behave very differently depending on context. So we've talked about lots of different scenarios today. We've talked about politics. We've talked about and in different cultures and different countries. The technologies and the way that they may be involved in our elections, um, for us, we may think and feel differently in the UK to how we do in the US or in, Ch in China. So I think recognising those different cultural contexts and, and why that matters in terms of the deployment of technology is important. Um, but also if we think about how AI is used in the context of education or health um, or in public sector decision making, these are all different contexts that will have different ramifications. So to roll back, for us, we really believe that the development of technology, that process um, needs to be something that has safeguards before the technology is released. Um, and then once it's released, we need to be working in collaboration with people with expertise in their contexts um, to be able to think about the different use cases and safeguards that are needed for their use. So if we're thinking about how should generative AI be used in, by teachers in schools, we need to work with teachers to be thinking about how they should be used to safeguard. But we also need to work with parents and children. What kind of school do we want? Um, what do we believe school is for? What skills should be learnt in that context? These are conversations we all need to be having. Um, to have those conversations, we need to be upskilled. It's really, these conversations are really hard. <laughs> like Technologies are really complicated. And at the moment, and recognising what AI and generative AI is, it's a black box system. Like Sometimes even the people building it don't understand and are very, uh, find it very hard to explain, and it's almost impossible to predict how they work. So upskilling us all so that we can have these conversations and really recognise the risks in these different use cases is also important. So there are lots of different steps, but my point being, we need to go along the journey of the development and the design and the deployment of the technology, and it needs to be context-specific. And I just add one final point. Regulation is re of technology is really hard to do because that technology changes so quickly. It takes years to develop regulation, and it's so easy to develop really poor regulation. Um, so, and there are lots of examples of that that we could think about. But I think, as a result, thinking about the development of technology as it's developed, that's when we need to be playing a role. You both want to come in, uh, but Jason, I'll come uh, first. I, I could not agree more that policy should be a reflection of our societal values. Uh, so much so that I've staked my entire professional career on being able to advise clients on what people think, which 50 years ago was incredibly controversial. What do you mean you're going to... It was uh, legislating by polling, right? It was, uh, it was like my finger in the air. I'm just going to... The popular will of the people... God forbid that... Uh, you know, an elected official who represents a, a, a group of people actually takes into account what they think and then actually then executes on that. And, and to me, the technology, uh, because it is limited by, it, it, is, it is both a reflection of the values of the people who program it and it is, also, it is also limited in that regard. It's not spontaneous. It doesn't act outside of the boundaries that, it is, that, that it's given. Yeah. Um, so uh, to me, it's just an extension of this idea, this concept that we as the body politic will continue to be the, the sort of the focal center of the policies that, uh, that, that create the boundaries of our own civil society. The, the, the regulation is imperative. It's incredibly hard. Uh, it's a necessary but not sufficient piece of all of this. But we should be taking into account what people think. And if the way that we now are going to express that is through technology as a way of kind of aggregating it all together in a more efficient and effective and fast way, then that's just what we have to react to. That, that, that is what we have. It's not going away. I, you know, the joke about the cars before, do we not drive because we're afraid of the ramifications? No, we, we build boundaries and safeguards and societal norms, look right, look right, look right, which is really hard for an American, by the way. When you're going across the street, we look left, and I've almost died a thousand times. Um, uh, we we uh, we we come up with our we come up with the guardrails, and I think that that will happen. Bob. So, um, I agree one hundred percent with Hannah's perspective on this. I agree one hundred percent that democracies need to take control, find a way to build guardrails, everything about it. However, I think that it's going to be the wild, wild west. And that's, when I wrote the book, I tried to imagine how it wouldn't be the wild, wild west, and it's the wild, wild west, because guys 
like us that have made money in politics would use it to make money. They'll do it. They will do it 100%. So, um, so I think it's going to be the wild, wild west. And then that comes to us. So we, li- we all live in a democracy. I'm assuming we all want to be in democracies. Democracies are fragile and then also extremely strong. They're really fragile, but yet we seem to win a lot, even when, when the chips are down. So that means that we are all sort of the last lines of defense on this thing, is my view. It's going to be the wild, wild west, and the people are going to be the last line of defense. And we have to use our own brain power and our own reason to identify what is real and what is fake. So my view is we all need to basically start playing with the technology. Go on ChatGPT. Ask, pick your favorite politician. Ask it to write a speech in the manner of your favorite politician. Explore it. See when it looks fake and when it's not. I have to say, Jason and I were talking about this, it doesn't write great speeches. It's only using the speeches it has publicly available, and it reads like pablum, okay? So it's it's weird. So give it, play with it, see it, use it to, to, to basically inform yourself. And because ultimately in a democracy, the people are the last line of defense. It's us. It's, it kind of becomes down to us. I mean, you, you, you say there, Bob, about us being able to interrogate and assess uh, the ver- veracity of, of, of information. But I, I think in the UK, we've had some pretty clear examples of us utterly failing to do that, you know, if, if we look at some of the um, mis and disinformation that was peddled around the what the consequences of leaving the EU would be, for instance, whatever you think mm-hmm. of, of that decision, there, there was a lot of mis and disinformation, and arguably people didn't um, use their their intelligence to discern to discern that. How how do we how can we sustain a kind of hopeful positivity that people will when it comes to AI. Jason? You can't legislate stupid away or hate. Um, I think it's interesting that with all the trouble that you had down south uh, last month, none of that made its way to Scotland. Uh, same disinformation was out there, and, and, and not you know there wasn't rioting in the streets on Princess Street. Um, so I, I think that there are sort of there are other elements that kind of play into this. Uh, there will, but there will always be stupid. And as a as a an enlightened society, I'm referring to Scotland, not the U.S. Uh, it's our responsibility to to manage it, to mitigate it. Um, it's we we're incredibly resilient. Uh, democracies democracies are incredibly resilient, and there will be problems. Were there never riots before AI or or technology? I mean, we, the human condition is the human condition. That doesn't change. Uh, we will be we'll, we will respond in the same way that we've responded to other problems, and you know, uh, and, and that had nothing to do with AI. It's just it's just a different medium that we will have to navigate and figure out, and we will. Hannah, just just a different different medium, or do you think there's a little bit more? <laughs> Hannah's solving all the problems, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I just spent lots of time feeling very worried about them. Um, I think we need to be really cautious about suggesting election outcomes are the result of mis- and disinformation, including Brexit. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we need to be really cautious about suggesting um, that because it it really suggests a really poor uh, view of democracy. Um, I think we need to respect people's votes, and I think we need to be cautious about... um, attributing people's views to mis- and disinformation because people have long sourced their information and their decisions about how they vote from lots of different sources. I think the volume and exposure to mis- and disinformation online is a problem, um, but there is actually very little evidence of how it affects our views. So I I think when we get upset about election results... We look for things to blame, um, but when you look at the evidence, it, there's very limited evidence to suggest that the Brexit result was as a result of missing disinformation. Um, just, just to talk about um, Southport and the recent missing disinformation and its contribution to riots, to the riots, I think we have to unpack 
why people share that content and believe it. And I think so much of missing disinformation is sadly persuasive because so much of it uses tropes that relate to yeah. views in our society um, which have not been tackled sufficiently. And I think what we saw with the riots were people who saw content that sadly they believed. Um, and sorry, I don't, I don't want to go too far into this because it's, it's beyond my brief. But I think disinformation is effective when it taps into existing values and existing attitudes. Um, and I think it's those attitudes that we need to be targeting, as well as the prolifera proliferation of mis and disinformation online and the speed with which um, it, it is possible uh, for that to um, spiral online. Um, but I think we as a society need to do better when there are information vacuums, because that period of time where people weren't given um, information about what was actually happening um, was fair. It was, there was reasons that information couldn't be shared, accurate information couldn't be shared. And rather than waiting for accurate information to be shared, people chose to make up and spread rumours that reflected their own values and beliefs. Um, and I think it's how we behave in moments of information <coughs> vacuums that we need to be thinking about and how we understand and evaluate what is fact and belief and opinion and what we do with the attitudes of others. That is something that I think we need to be working on. And separately, I also think we need to be working on trust in our police and trust in, in our politics. Mm. But I just, I'm just really cautious about blaming content and mis and disinformation on behaviour. No, no I, I, I think that, that that's re re really helpful. And, and as you did there, bringing it back to trust, and I, I suppose the damage that that mis and disinformation does, even if it, doesn't, if it doesn't have an impact on people's decisions in the ballot box, mm. it diminishes trust in not only politics but other social institutions that that are potentially and, and it's that loss of trust that's potentially so damaging for, for society as a whole exactly. okay. i'm keen to open it up to questions and comments from <laughs> from you um, a couple of hands already going up we have a microphone that will come round because as, as i said this has been been uh, recorded so please put, put your hands up we'll take two or three points and then, then come back to the panel and then I'll open it up again. Hand right at the back there and then a couple at the front. Thanks. Thanks. I, I, I'm sure uh, we'll get a, uh, a prompt for the uh, session on responsible debate later, but uh, I'd highly recommend you come to that to discuss some of these issues further. It might be because I've helped to create that session. But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, 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 thing, the thing I wanted to say, and it was interesting conversations gone, gone to where the point sits, that um, I, I, think it's, I think there are a lot of ways in which humans think that uh, we can't deal with through technology, but what we can do is understand how technology gets to those pressure points. And I think what happened in Southport uh, with the riots was that social media did one of the things that it's really bad at, which is identifying one of those pressure points in the way humans think mm -hmm. and funneling people towards a set of actions that were a, a real problem. And I think one of the things about regulating social media, which I think was the last thing in this space, because we must be wary of trying to regulate the last thing when we come to this thing, is that I don't think we realised that that's how social media was going to work ten years ago, when Twitter was a nice place to be, and when, when social media wasn't the place that was triggering uh, wasn't the place where, where those pressure points were being pushed. And I think the failure in, in that was that we didn't get the, we didn't understand the ways in which human behaviour might interact with social media. And one of the things I think it, my, my, my thinking about solutions in this is that we need to game this, we need to play with this, we need to have uh, uh, scenarios where people are put in to control environments and we understand what their reactions are likely to be so that we can begin to regulate it. Mm. Uh, I, think, I think the technical terms is, is anticipatory regulation and I, and I think we do far too little of that at the moment. What we do is wait for something to go wrong, wait two years, then start thinking about legislation and then the legislation takes another two years to come. So by the time you've regulated for something, you're regulating for something that happened four years ago and the technology moved right the way on. And I wonder about some of your thoughts uh, in how we can 
we can build those sort of structures so that we can get the regulation to the right place. Because I think just saying people have to learn uh, what what happens in social mm. media or what happens with AI is it's not good enough. And, and I think particularly about that moment where uh, Putin put out that uh, deepfake of Zelensky saying uh, that he left the country mm -hmm. uh, yeah. on, the, on the point of invasion. And it wasn't a very good deepfake. And I think that's what saved the situation. Had it been a good deepfake, we couldn't have said to people that's mm -hmm. nothing. And, and I think we need, we need to game these situations. We need to understand it and then base the regulation on that. And I just need to be a bit of thoughts on that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we've got a couple at the, f at the front, but just doing a quick microphone swap. Well, well, while we're waiting, do you, do you want do you want to talk, uh, Hannah? Do you want to come in the questions around gaming scenarios and anticipatory regulation? Yeah, absolutely. So, I think there are a number of things that would have been better um, on social media. Like one being um, the algorithms that are used. Um, so recognising that algorithms generate and show us content which is the most clickable. Um, and we know from psychological research that we, we tend to click on things which are really emotional and often things that we disagree with and make us really angry. Um, so there's a reason these spaces are really emotive and really angry because that's like how they're programmed to be. Um, we know that from psychological research and also because of the way that those spaces are designed. Um, we also know that there are alternative algorithms, bridging-based algorithms, for example, that can be used that would um, build more consensus and show us content that helps balance our perspectives. Um, and these are things that have been trialled and tested and, and proven to be great. So that would be lovely. Um, we also know that social media platforms can change their algorithms in moments that are um, violent and risky. So we know that... Um, during the capital invasion in America, Meta changed their algorithm during that period. Um, so this is something that social media platforms can choose to do, whether we want it to be their choice um, and whether that's something that we want to enforce um, is harder because what you're then trying to build into regulation is something that's a, a technical solve and there may be alternatives. So how do we go about regulating social media platforms so that they're moving in the direction that results in the kinds of technologies that, that are more conducive to our society. So there are examples of legislation. So the EU AI Act, for example, Digital Services Act. So the EU has, has brought out some of the most strong regulation, um, which would impose fines on, which essentially looks at uh, the amount, the length that certain content stays on the platform, particularly harmful content. Um, so there is legislation that, that can be brought out. In the Online Safety Act in the UK, um, provisions around mis- and disinformation uh, were removed from the Online Safety Act. And there's a reason for that. And that is because mis- and disinformation is um, very difficult to pin down because what is fact changes over time, particularly in live situations. Or is disputed in real time. Or is disputed in real time. And do we want decisions about what is fact, particularly in political situations, to be made by technology companies or worse, by algorithms? So mis- and disinformation is just a really, really difficult thing um, to regulate around. And we've also seen that playing out in the EU with, with the kind of the, the knock-on effect of the way that that legislation is being, is being used. Like, there's been a lot of criticism um, for the role that's been played around what content has been taken down, particularly around Israel-Gaza conflict. So... It's, it's, it's just a really difficult thing. <laughs> so, yes, there are steps that can be taken, different algorithms. I'd also highlight that in the last, um, I think, 18 months, with the change of leadership at X, um, there have been, as we've seen, very significant changes to the platform. So there are other things that can be done. The level of investment in trust and safety teams, human oversight of content moderation and the, moder and the algorithms that are used for moderation. I think we're seeing that community notes isn't necessarily the most effective approach, although that hasn't been proven in evidence. Okay. Do either of you want to comment on that? Bob? Yeah, I mean, I, um, so, alternatively, um, my, I have a theory that basically politics and regulation and law are downstream from culture. And so a lot of the things we're talking about, about human behavior and social media, can be fixed if modern people rediscover stoicism, which is 
Your emotions are not your friend. Uh, immediately responding to things is not your friend. Sometimes silence and thought and waiting is your friend, is the wisest course. We don't really talk about it anymore. But I do think there's, yes, we should look at regulation and everything, but also ultimately culture and being smart and using your brain and slowing down and not being manipulated by things that are trying to obviously manipulate your emotion and maybe realizing that your emotion is not your friend is a good thing. Just have to pause. Right. <laughs> Didn't all of our mothers teach us this? <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't want to say really that, but I will say ironically that, the, the, that one of the solutions to this idea of gaming out the solutions, mm -hmm. say I. Because <laughs> it's just, it, it can be the best of us really fast, yeah. Yeah. faster than we could ever be. A couple of questions um, at, at the front here. Thanks. Right in the front row. And then there was somebody just behind, I think, earlier. But front row first. <coughs> Thank you. One of the things that's fascinated me um, with everything you've said so far is a requirement that we have for proof. You mentioned watermarking, which I thought was fascinating. And it made me think of um, if somebody had kidnapped somebody in the photograph that they send, they have today's newspaper, proof that that's today. Um, and today we prove we are who we are with multi-factor authentication. So these requirements for proof keep coming through. Um, we've all had an email that at least appears to be from somebody that we know. So this isn't new. You said that earlier. And there aren't any regulations that say people can't do that. You know, if no one's going to look into where that came from or put the time into it, it was up to us to learn and become trained in the fact that probably that's not who you think it is. If they're saying, hi, how's your day? It's probably okay. If they're asking you to send them money, at least take five seconds to think about it. Um, and if, you know, if somebody's, what's the one that says, you know, I'm on a holiday and I've lost all my money, please wire me some money. You phone them and you say, did you just send me an email? Because you require that proof. So I think... For me today, the big thing for me is proof or requiring of proof. What was there a question just, just behind? I thought I saw somebody's hand earlier. No, okay. I also have a question. Okay, yeah, the se second row. Thanks. Um, hi, so my question is about a couple of times people have mentioned like the bad guys. Are there certain groups of people or uh, yeah, groups of people who we have identified as particularly likely to create deep fakes and use them maliciously because I feel like it's quite impossible to combat it if we don't specify who we're actually talking about. Okay. Shall we pick those up? Yeah. The, the bad guys. Uh, well, I, 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 or, or proof. No, well, Which, I'll add, yeah. add to the bad guys question, but I think it's actually important that we just very quickly, um, I think we tend to swap mis and disinformation unintentionally. Um, so... So bad guys, we are implying that there's intent. That's disinformation, so that's really important. Yeah, we know exactly who the bad guys are. It's Russia, it's China, it's Iran, uh, they, who are intentionally sowing disinformation as a, as a disruptive tool. So we do know where a lot of the stuff is coming from. Um, what we don't know is what's gonna get us. We, because there are other actors and bad guys who are putting stuff out there that we just we don't know where that's coming from. I'm amazed on the Southport thing. They found the source. Like, I don't even understand that. Like, that is like the literal needle in the haystack, right? And they found the source in Pakistan and arrested the guy. No, he wasn't. I thought it was Pakistan. See, no. it's more fake news. No, it wasn't. He did. They found somebody who repeated it. Oh, he was right, right, right. Yeah, right. but it, they they did find the initial woman who was British British based. Oh, there's somebody in Pakistan who has a, a news website who so, repeated so, it. So, so I I, I I take great solace in that, like that we that we can actually mm -hmm. chase down and identify the bad guys as a way of protecting ourselves um, from more of the the silliness. Yeah. Bob, I would love to answer your question, or because. So you and I are on the same exact wavelength. So I've been thinking the problem is authentication. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the, that's the big question is authentication. What is real? What is not real? And I came to this a while ago, which is we already, and I don't know what it's called in this country. In America, we call them notary public, a notary public. They authenticate documents. 
they say and you have to go through training and sign you know, swear and all this stuff. I'm sure they have a notary public. Yes. I don't know what they call it. The same thing? Same thing. Same thing. Okay. So we have that in law and culture in our countries. And so, like, how would you do that for the 21st century for videos? Like, you, it, it, this is just free thinking, open thinking. But, like, could you say we're going to use notary publics to authenticate that this is video that was – I was witnessing. I was in parliament. I'm always in parliament as a witness. You have witnesses, basically. We have this in common law. You have witnesses. So maybe we just develop – a group of people that are witnesses for saying, okay, I saw this physically filmed. I am who I say I am. I authenticate this. And Jason was raising a great point over breakfast this morning, which is in America, we passed a law that says when you run an ad, you have to say, and I endorse this message on air, the, face, the to face to camera, and I endorse this message. Right? And so now bad guys could still fake that. But like the idea is a third party authenticator could be. Yeah, we're still figuring this out, but that's the wonderful thing about like common law and about how we developed our societies is we just keep trying things until they work. Can, can we always identify, I mean, in, in some ways, do, do we have to wait to identify the bad guys before we do these kinds of things? And I, th I think it, it comes back to the, the earlier point about the, the, the time lag, you know, something, something bad happens and we respond. There, there isn't that anticipation. And... Does authentication need to be anticipatory in, 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 in a sense? Yeah. I, I, this is just open thinking, but you could do things that just say, like, if it's government channels or, like, major channels that you basically have people who are third-party authenticators. I mean, the thing is, this is what we should be having the, the media, the journalists are, <laughs> are third-party authenticators, right? So it's like how we... And the, unfortunately, though, like, in a lot of our countries, the independent media is in decline because the economics of it doesn't work very well. Well, I don't know Jason. if they have it in the UK, but in the US, I, th I think it's a similar thing. Uh, we, uh, there's a regulatory framework in restaurants. Uh, and if you are uh, an approved restaurant, if you've, if you've passed sort of the regulatory hurdle, then there's a sticker in the window. And, you know, woe unto, the, woe unto you if you go into a restaurant that doesn't that doesn't have that sticker, I mean, you're like the, at your own peril, right? So maybe part of what this is is anticipatory in that we have trusted messengers, and whether it's a, an authenticator or it's a, the, the actual media channels, uh, that we do have to invest some of our trust in somebody else's authority because uh, we can't possibly know every, all things at all times uh, as individuals. And, and I suppose it links into what Hannah was talking about earlier with boundaries and, and having either, either codes or, 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 or principles of, of operation. Earlier in the week, when we were talking about the legalities and ethics involved in, in AI, you know, we, we, have, we have principles in law about, you know, you, you, you should have to consent to certain things. You should have... We should have, we should be able to trust certain communications, and you know, maybe maybe it's about strengthening and understanding and the the use of those principles rather than trying to get very very specific legislation or regulation because we can't predict right. where, where the tech is going to be in two weeks, never mind five years. You know, if if we're thinking about legislative programs. What's interesting is you're seeing some of this now in lawsuits in the United States from authors who say who are saying that the large language models are essentially using their copyrighted their work and not paying them right and so like I do think that it's a version of that a little bit because it's garbage in garbage that, out that's a, that's a perfect example of where existing legislation is effective I mean copyright laws being used now to prevent yeah. that from happening right. and it's why we've got lawsuits in the UK as well around right. Um, but there's also opportunities. I mean, you're going to the business model of news, but there have been negotiations underway by newspapers who are, who are seeking to ensure that the way that their news archives are being used to train language models is something that they can actually get money from because it's their content. Right. Um, but I just just going back, because I think the question about bad guys, I think, is is really important because I think, I think we need to be specific about... I'm, I'm always a little bit, like, 
or very reluctant to just describe people as intrinsically bad. I think it's the behaviour that is bad. Um, so where there are behaviours that are bad, um, those are things that we can all be doing. Like, they are... I, used to, in a different life, be a teacher. Um, and sadly, that was at a time when you had 12-year-olds with access to TikTok who were filming on their phones and putting up videos of their mates on TikTok. And that's a scenario where you've got images of children and video going out onto the free web um, that can be used by anyone. And these are all things that we can be doing by mistake. Like, we can be contributing to scenarios where we are sharing misinformation. And that's the interesting thing with misinformation. Uh, the reason I put those phrases together, misinformation, is because something becomes misinformation when somebody reshares it, not knowing that the initial intent was harmful. Um, and I think we should unpack what we mean by intent to do harm. There's a difference between the strategies which are used by um, foreign actors with deliberate kind of attack strategies, which is to weaken... Uh, democratic processes and we can trust in politicians that is one strategy which is being used by state actors some state actors um, there are also behaviors that we all do in our day-to-day -day lives on social media where we might be a bit like oh that's a really good rumor about Blake Ive Lively let's retweet that because it's really engaging let's share that with um, my daughter on whatsapp like the number of times when my partner picks out something that I have believed from Twitter um, because I thought it was really interesting and then he points out that who shared that and you're like, oh no, actually that might not be true. Like it is so easy to be misled um, and, I, and it's so easy to reshare content without realising the harm that it can do. So I just, yeah. Which I think brings us back to the point that you made. Uh, you've just very casually observed that we've all gotten that email. Maybe it's the friend on holiday or it's the... Our, our version of that is the Nigerian prince um, <laughs> offering me a deal I can't refuse. Uh, there's a reason why um, the cohorts of people who over-index as victims of fraud are, uh, are generally older people who are less digitally literate uh, and who are even, even less than that informationally literate, illiterate. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I think there's the trust issue, but also if... So the whole like the session is about AI and deep fakes and politics, and I noted that Trump got the Trump video of Kamala that got retweeted was called out immediately by a lot of highly digitally literate consumers of, of information, and I'm not saying that's the solution that we it has to work in partner in partnership with government and business, but there is this a personal responsibility uh, encouraged and provided the resources by the government. Um, to be a more digitally literate society. If you've seen it, if you know it, and you're, like, if you're new to email, and you get an email that says, oh my gosh, I need help, and you aren't a skeptic because you've, n you, you've never seen that before, then yeah, you're going to send them 100 quid, and you're out. Goodbye. If we are more digitally literate, that, that sort of multi-factor authentication just gets built into our, uh, into our modus operandi, and, and that reduces the the negative impact that some of these bad actors can have. Okay, Bob, and then I'll come back to this, the... This is... Just for the group, because maybe somebody would... This is, like, not a bad business idea, so think about it. <laughs> think about Rotten Tomatoes. Like, you and I should do this. Rotten Tomatoes for movies, yep. but Rotten Tomatoes for, like, content, where people, you have... You, you have a bunch of smart people who, who you know are, are not idiots who watch this stuff, and they rate it based on likelihood to be authentic versus not, and you crowdsource it and you give it a number. They're fact-checking organizations. <laughs> but, not, but not like two guys that are fact-checking, but like no, crowdsource it, like a couple uh, thousand. That's, 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 that's the <laughs> moderation approach that's used on Twitter. Okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I just invented something that's been invented. <laughs> so you a couple of questions there, and then one at the front. I'm catching up with five years. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Laurie, and um, first of all, thanks very much for this panel. It's been really fascinating, I think. Um, I actually, I work in technology um, at a tech startup, um, and I think the key word with AI that we haven't talked about much is scale. Um, and so it's interesting thinking about that kind of Putin putting a Zelensky video out there that's fake. But I think what's interesting, and I'd love to hear your opinions about, is the way in which behavior can be modified through very embedded and stealthy tactics. So just to sort of go back for context I think traditional programming is where you say if someone asks me what is 2 plus 2 a programmer writes some code and says let's go and do that operation it's 4 there's a limited number of use cases you can go and test that 
with AI and large language models, as uh, Jason talked about. You know, these are just kind of, um, sorry, Robert <laughs> talked about, um, these are just basically sort of coming up with the next word that they think, that they think they should go there, based on all of the training data that has been inputted into it. So you can think of an AI system almost, with well, these ones in particular, as basically being given a bunch of books, reading them, and then saying, well, right, what do you think should go next? As you can imagine, depending what training data has been given will highly affect the output. So if I'm a homeopath, I might go and create an AI medical system that is based on all of that, alternative medicine. And if I'm an NHS doctor, I might create an AI, AI system that is produced from medical literature that has a basis in science. I'm not a homeopath. Um, I think what is interesting in the global context in this time, with international politics particularly, and talking about China and Russia and places where there are state systems mixing with business, and particularly in the context of technology where there are open source sys software, which you know, people think of as being uh, created by a community and is truly a wonder of the web, but there are also closed AI systems such as ChatGPT. Um, you know, is there the literacy, the understanding of what the difference between those systems are? If I'm just using my phone as a consumer and chatting with some sort of system that's day to day, giving me answers maybe a thousand times a day about things because it's replacing Google, and I don't have visibility of where that training data has come from, and perhaps the training data has come from some source that has deliberately made it misogynistic, maybe completely unconsciously made it misogynistic because of the language in there. Um, how do we respond to that threat where it's such a sort of insidious and stealthy uh, manipulation of behavior that is so hard to vet and verify because that training data is invisible. It's not even, as, as we talked about, it's a black box. Um, so yeah, my question is really around that kind of international politics front, how do we deal with this completely different threat when AI is growing at an exponential rate you know, they talk about the fact that it's maybe if you think it's got the intelligence of, an, uh, intelligence of an ant right now, it'll be a cat in three years, and it'll be a human in five years, and then it'll be the smartest human in six years, and then it'll be superhuman in ten years. So we're going to go through this change incredibly quickly. How do we keep up with that, especially in the context of regulation being something that takes years to evolve? Thank you. Just a couple of rows in front. person had their hand up? Yeah. Yeah, thank you indeed. Lots to think about this morning. Thank you. Um, I think I've picked up um, a theme of in trying to get the good and deal with the bad in AI, we're trying to discern what is real and what is not real. And that seems to me fundamentally flawed because the whole nature of AI is building on the social construction nature and not knowing what is real. And that's what AI is about. So say so going back to the example of um, was the vote for Brexit based on information, disinformation, um, were the recent riots, no suggestion they were caused by underlying rhetoric. But actually, how do we actually address that the underlying beliefs that triggered the riots, that triggered a Brexit vote, were actually created by, by AI? How do we deal with that broader context rather than a quite utilitarian, if we work out what's true or not true, we'll solve the problem? Thank you. And third question, just right at the front. If I picked you up correctly, Chairman, you said at one point just now we should be able to trust. Why should we? As humans, we should be constantly questioning and challenging. So the idea that we should automatically trust any particular source seems to me itself perhaps a question for consideration. OK, thank you. I, I, I think... You know, we've got, got th three three different areas there: scale and and and, and stealth. Uh, questions around social constructions and the beliefs that underpin what we identify as true or not, and the trust. I, I think I suppose it's trust in the political process. Um, you know, we we want to be able to trust the decisions that when you go into a ballot box, you put an X or or a number in a box. That is actually what's what comes out the other end. If that if that if that makes sense. That that's the kind of kind of trust I'm, I was talking about. Uh, I'm going to let, let the panel uh, address any or all of these. Jason, do you want to kick, kick things off with, uh, with sure. any, any of, of those issues? I have three choices. Um, so one of my clients, uh, and oh, this is all very public, so, I, uh, so one of my clients is the United States Chamber of Commerce Foundation, which uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce basically represents U.S. businesses um, uh, as an advocacy organization for U.S. businesses, and the foundation kind of takes that a step further and they get to do all the fun things that businesses wouldn't ever do, like, for example, 
uh, there's a program about defending democracy. Uh, and the, the foundational hypothesis of their mission and this particular uh, project is that civil society is failing because of a lack of um, engagement with, with our civic sort of processes, uh, which is largely driven by uh, a lack of information uh, and, a lack of, uh, and a lack of understanding. So um, I spent a lot of time highlighting the fact that, uh, and I'll only focus on Americans, that most Americans uh, fail civics tests, largely because we've stopped teaching it. And so I think this return to a more engaged citizen, and again, I'm, I'm like beating a drum about, about we, we, are, we have a responsibility, but we can see it in, in real life that uh, what was the turnout uh, in our elections two years ago, 66%? That's a bad. That's a bad number, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and that is. It's and it's not because people don't care. It's that they just don't see their role in civil society. So I say to, to the point about those undertones of what may or may not be wrong with society. AI, I think, uh, and social media uh, often kind of takes advantage of that or highlights it uh, as a as a, a glitch in the system. Um, but I think the, the actual, the signal and noise, I think the signal is that we're just woefully uh, underappreciative of our own individual roles in kind of lifting democracy up together. Um, and that's, I think that's just an information gap. I think it's just, it's just we need to be smarter, more informed as citizens and consumers, and things, and, and things will rise, not completely, because we need government, we need business cooperation, but we, we will, we'll have fewer of these problems if we're all just more civically aware. Hannah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the, I, w I wanted to make sure I understood um, your point that you were making just in the context of um, the, the beliefs that people had that motivated their behavior around the riots. Were you suggesting that they were their core beliefs or that you felt that those beliefs the were triggered? AI has a significant contribution to have created those, so therefore we can't make that rather simplistic separation mm. between the underlying problems in society mm. that triggered it. Yeah, so that's interesting because for me, I think, and I will talk about training data and, and the issues that we have in training data for AI, but for me, I, I think that um, very sadly, anti-immigrant beliefs, um, racist beliefs in our society have been here long before AI. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I sadly recognize that they could be exacerbated, they can be played upon, um, but they weren't put there by AI. Um, I think, and that's the problem, uh, that's a, a significant problem that I believe needs a separate solution, an educational solution, um, a democratic solution, one that links to um, politics, and, 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 it's a, and it's a political, there's also a political um, issue there as well, depending on your view on migration policy, which is distinct from uh, racist beliefs, but the the other, just going back to the issue around training data and what what happens when you're uh, speaking to ChatGPT and it's telling you and it's giving you answers that reflect um, misogynistic beliefs, for example, and that's a reflection of of training data. I think there are things. I mean, we've and we've seen this in um, the legislation that's included in the EU AI Act. There are steps that can be taken. Um, to evaluate the safety of models, um, including the training data. So there are there are regulatory prompts that can encourage or force companies, unless and if they don't do so in certain time periods, be fined um, to be releasing the tests that they perform on their training data. So you can model lots of different scenarios um, before. Um, these models are released into the general public, or indeed, once they are into the general public, um, where you are evaluating it and, and what threat level um, it has, what level of uh, or types of hallucinations these models are having. So you can evaluate the safety of, of these models, and I think if you're releasing the results of those evaluations and creating greater transparency, and that's going to a separate independent regulatory body to evaluate those results, you can use that to then determine what level of access the public should be given to these tools. So much like other kind of um, 
business regulation. It's just a different approach to business regulation that reflects the, the dangers and risks of, of those models and the training data that's used. Um, but just on the point of why should we trust content or why should we trust? I, for me, I, I believe it is right to have a healthy level of scepticism around who we trust. And I think um, we should be cautious about who we trust. I, I was taught as a child, like, be cautious when you don't know someone. Like, um, wait until they've demonstrated who they are and and, and the same goes for, for content. And we are taught in schools how to evaluate the reliability of um, what we read and, and how to um, assess evidence. And these are all skills that we are taught in school, whether they're related and whether there is sufficient transference to social media and media, I would argue, and sorry, I recognize that the English curriculum is different to Scottish and Welsh and so on, um, so it's devolved, but in the English curriculum, there is very little, there is no social media uh, content that we're um, taught in our core curriculum um, that allows us to translate those skills into that space. And I would argue that's a step that we need in the next curriculum review. But I think that's separate to the political literacy point, a civic literacy point that you were making. Um, I do think education around how political systems work is important, but I also think that there's other reasons why people aren't turning out to vote. And that's not because they don't understand politics or because they're lacking enthusiasm in how to support their neighbours or their community but because of a loss of faith in politics mm -hmm. because politics has stopped working for people and I think the reflection of the levels of inequality in our society are a key kind of evidential marker of that like people are being failed by democratic institutions and I think where people aren't turning out I think that's a reflection of it and that's not an AI problem that's a, a democracy problem. So I love these three questions. I'm going to go one, two, three and answer them. And um, what I think is interesting is if, with your three questions here, really we're in a sort of a temple of democracy. This is a parliament, right? So, but your questions highlight the strength of how a democracy works, where we learn together. We have collective intelligence. So, to, so really quick to answer the three questions, to address them or think through them. I love your question because... This society exited the Middle Ages and where the church had the monopoly on thought, what was dogma, what was allowed to be thought, what was not. And we entered the Enlightenment. And our country is based on Enlightenment, the Enlightenment thinkers, right? Our Constitution was written by people who believed in the Enlightenment, right? Which is based in part on the idea of skepticism and doubt. Even doubt in what you think to be true today might not be true. So that's a really good point. Is we should entertain a healthy skepticism because it's the beginning of wisdom. So I think that's really good. Your question is interesting because I think it conflates some things. So there's true and not true. That's hard. Jason and I walking over here were debating disinformation and misinformation. I was saying the nature of scientific revolution is to have an idea that challenges convention and everybody else thinks you're crazy until it turns out that the data actually backs you up, right? The earth is round, right? We had a world in which the earth was not round, was believed to be flat. We had a world in which the earth was the center of the universe, not the sun. It was wrong to think that the earth was not the center of the universe, right? And people, and until, I mean, Galileo got in trouble for it, right? So like we were talking about this as some things that people say that we might that critics might label misinformation or disinformation might actually be true later, and they're not trying to be nefarious. They actually have a new idea, you know? So, it's, so, so I think what we're talking about, so there's true and untrue, but there's also authentic and inauthentic. And I think with deep fakes, we're talking about authentic versus inauthentic. Is it the, is it the actual thing, the actual person speaking, is it an authentic copy or is it an inauthentic copy? True and untrue, would be, and I'm thinking like in four, like, like a two dimension thing, true and untrue would be like whether we're saying misinformation, disinformation, authentic, inauthentic would be like deep fakes. So, anyway, I was just thinking, but it's a really interesting. T and then the technology. So, when I wrote the novel, I said it in the near future where humans were at the doorstep of strong AI, but not yet quite there. Because I, your point is apt. Like the technology is an S curve, and it just goes like that, right? Um, but we're not there yet, right? And large language models are, they're garbage in, garbage out. And I don't know if y'all have read about this, but basically, 
if you have a, a corpus of training data and the data is true to whatever you're trying to train it on today, you used medical journals, for example, um, but the wider you expand that corpus and it includes less quality data, the dumber the large language model gets. So it may be that the more um, language that these large language models hoover up, you know, suck up into their models, the dumber the large language model gets, right? And people could manipulate it by just inserting, like, if I just created cut and paste, like, after the word and insert ampersand, the ampersand sign, over time, the large language model would just have ampersands all over it, right? Because that's how it works. It's not thinking. It's just guessing the next word based on that. So it is an, it's an interesting issue that we have today. It's garbage in, garbage out. Well, you... <laughs> um, pe people can be dumb, but that doesn't make it illegal or... So the, you, right, right, so, it's not so, illegal to right, be stupid. So, but you said like you know, garbage in, garbage out, but the, the, the more stuff that you put in there, I, actually the more it resembles the, the, our public square. It, res it resembles us. We as a, as, a, as a corpus are not all experts on any one thing. We have opinions and points of view and some of them may be right and wrong. I think AI models are actually just a reflection of the sort of democratic process. It's just, it's all of our viewpoints, all clicked in. Some of them are dumb, and some of them are brilliant, and some of them are, uh, we don't yet know. And it's, and that's what the, and, and that's what it, it's transparently, what it says it is, is it is like all the information. It's not all the right information. Because I don't know that I want anybody to have the authority to say, this is right and everything else is wrong. But that you, makes me very it's nervous. It's what you train it on. So imagine the NHS or our medical systems or medic teaching hospitals in our country or the NHS here, whatever, trains AI. It's the training material. So it looks at all sorts of diagnoses, millions and millions of diagnoses and all that. You know, it's what you train it on, right? So it's like if you train it on garbage or like all the all the dumb things people say about their cats on TikTok, then it just talks about cats oh, on TikTok, about, uh, right? But if it president? talks about the diagnosis, yeah, then... But, but what about a president uh, saying that, that maybe we should consider in, injecting bleach into our... <laughs> How does the how does the large language model know that the president should be ignored in that particular situation? I I just think there's an authority issue here that I'm just inherently uncomfortable yeah. with. But, yeah, and that, and that's why we learned that we shouldn't trust ChatGPT for our information. Like it's it's recognizing the difference between crowdsourced information that isn't gate kept by an authoritative figure, which is what we're used to in our media systems. Like previously, we'd rely on the re most recent scientific evidence that has been endorsed by a particular organization that's been regulated right. and then spoke like re restoring our trust in gatekeepers and an appetite for wanting that expertise mm -hmm. and to be reaching for that evidence that's the the kind of appetite that we should be nurturing and and the skills that we should be reminding people of um and ensuring that because i would argue a lot of these models aren't very good at prompting and reminding users this isn't you know this isn't this isn't, the Bible, <laughs> this right, isn't right. expert um this is mainly garbage um so th there's there's that too, but I do think at the moment we don't have enough demand for remembering why it's important to look at news articles and, and reputable news articles more so than what a hundred people said on Twitter. Like because I think we got really excited. Well, I think there was yeah well, the, I think the crowds. The I think I would, we are in these vertical information shoots, and and we we have just uh, it discounted anything that doesn't align with what we already think. So I mean, uh, your, your, I think your argument is that basically. Citizens in a democracy need to double down on being critical thinkers, and, right? And restore their trust in, and, and experts need to, like, earn and maintain this trust, but to restore their trust in experts. I think, but I think it's, it's important to distinguish when people vote, and we all have an equal right and say in, in who we vote for, that those are decisions that are informed over time, right? And that's different to the appetite just to see what everyone in the population thinks. So, you know, we use information for different points in, in our lives for different reasons. And, I, yeah, mm -hmm. I just think we need to remember that there's reasons we appoint people as experts and want them at the right moments. 
Thanks, Hannah. We've, we're coming to the end, so I'm going to give each of our panellists a, a minute to say one final thing that you want, you, you want us to, to take, take away from this discussion about democracy, authentication, where, where, we, where we go. What, what is it that we need to, we as citizens, as people who want to be active in our citizenship and, and be part of, of a vibrant democracy, what, what is it that we need to be considering when we think about deep fakes, AI, and its role in our democracy? Just a minute. Just a minute. Okay. Very, very quick. Um, so uh, demographically speaking, uh, and as a pollster, I'll tell you, you are exactly the same as the 10 people closest to you. That you are in, uh, you, you are undifferentiated uh, at a sort of a macro level. And I think it's a reflection of people gravitating toward other people who agree with them and who they, and there's a familiarity and comfort. Uh, and that's fine, except that then your beliefs are informed only by the people who agree with you. I mentioned these vertical shoots. Um, deep fakes and all the other bad things that we've talked about will be uh, will have less of an impact if we are just a little more open to other points of view. Uh, that w that as we I talk about intelligent consumers and informed consumers, if if we have. To, uh, at least an understanding that there's another point of view and, and it, we're not hostile to it, and this gets back to civil society, that it's okay to disagree as long as you keep the dialogue open. So I would say, so I think these problems are less problematic if we're just a little bit smarter and a little more open-minded about what other people think. Now, we don't have to agree with them, uh, but we should at least be informed about what th that other person thinks. Hannah. I love this question, it's a big question. Um, <laughs> I think going back to um, the point we were making at the very beginning about being really careful about evidencing the impact of these technologies on our democracy and being mindful of the fact that we have very little proof that it has actual impact on the decisions that we make at the ballot box. And so being cautious about overstating the role that technology plays in our decisions and our behavior. Our behavior is a reflection of the decisions we make on a composite of both information, our attitudes, our beliefs, the people we surround ourselves by at any one point. And so to your point about reliable information and being um, open to other people's ideas, I think just being cautious about um, the quality of the information we use to make our decisions and on which we act, but also the people that we listen to um, and being open to um, finding consensus because in a democracy what we're doing is not just giving our own view individually, we're also actively looking to learn and listen to one another to find consensus, that's what makes democracy strong and I think we only build resilience in our democracy to the evolution of technology if we remember um, those principles, reliable information and, and consensus building. So I think, in, t in summary, I think it will be the Wild West because I don't think it'll be easy to regulate. And I think the technology will go faster than our legislatures, which means you're the last line of defense. Um, that's one. I think nation states are doing an interesting two-step dance. Uh, on one hand, they want to regulate it within their boundaries on the other hand, they will all want to weaponize it because there's a theory called revolution in military affairs that says every nation state, when it, every empire nation state, whatever, when there's a new technology, the first one to figure out how to weaponize it the most gets hegemony or gets some advantage that they use on the battlefield. So all major countries will want to find ways to weaponize it and use it to destabilize their opponents. So this is a problem because we want to protect ourselves, but then we're gonna try to use it as a weapon. So I think that's a challenge. Um, and then just some things to anticipate about the near future, I think. I think there will be some nefarious actors that attempt to manipulate the stock market or commodities market. I think that will happen, right? I think there'll be lots of new forms of crime that I haven't even thought of yet, that none of us have, to, people will invent new forms of crime. I've learned about a new form of crime today from Hannah that's apparently not as new, as, but is pretty horrible. Um, as, a, as a parent, as a dad, it, that sounds horrific, but you know, okay. So, people, so bad folks will invent all kinds of new crimes. Um, and then I think the last one is people will 
experiment with this, and they're going to run candidates for fun at first, and then for real later. Uh, and that's good. And you know, maybe someday in the future, we'll be talking about somebody running an actual AI candidate in the next couple of years. And that'll be that'll be fun too. Fun, something to look forward to, maybe. <laughs> Just I want to end, end there by saying a huge thank you to all of you for coming along to this discussion. Thank you for, for contributing, those who were able to. And can I remind you all, please do, if, if you booked for, for this event on Eventbrite, you will get an email with a, a short feedback form. Please do fill that out. There are a couple of paper copies at the back as well. It helps us improve things for, for next year and, and take on board comments for suggested panels and, and, and discussions as well. So, so we, 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 can, we can respond to the things that, that you, would, you would like us to be talking about. Uh, later on, on, on today, there, there are a, a few of the last events happening in the Festival of Politics. We've got a discussion on democracy in elections in 50 countries uh, just after, after lunch. There's a discussion on incel uh, communities and incel cultures at, uh, as one. Um, and we also have uh, the, a discussion about responsible debate and how we can make debates in society and in our politics uh, more responsible. So th th there's a, a lead-in uh, fr from this discussion, I think. And then, of course, our, our, our last event, the Parliament at 25, because we are celebrating our 25th anniversary of the Scottish Parliament, the, the reformed Scottish Parliament um, this, this year. But last thing to say, thank you very much to Bob, to Hannah and to Jason for your contributions, your thoughts and for challenging us and making us think. Thank you. <laughs>